Okay, one more minute. <laughs> Started, everyone. All right, everybody, we're going to get started. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce Emmy Nakamura, today's plenary speaker. And so when I was thinking about what to say today, I got to reflecting on some of the first times I met Emmy. And honestly, those are some kind of stressful moments in my life. So the, the first time I met Emmy was uh, the first time I ever went to the NBR Summer Institute. So this was uh, 2005. And I had written a paper with Bart Hobine, and Bart gets up and presents it. And then, you know, the tradition is that the, the co-authors get up and stand in front of the audience for questions. And so there were questions, and then Emmy raises her hand and asks something about, you know, footnight, footnote 15. She didn't think that the expression there was correct. <laughs> what, are, what are you supposed to do with that? And then, uh, as I recall, the next question was from Bob Hall. Well, question isn't really the right word for what Bob Hall does. So Bob informed us that he had made this point in an earlier paper in the 1960s or something like that. So the, the next time I met Emmy was at the uh, Nordic Macro Workshop. Uh, this was like 2008. So I was still a grad student and, um, and I was about to go in the job market. I was going to be presenting my job market paper. There were lots of... Uh, important people, including Victor Rios Rule, who was, you know, it's enough to be terrified in its own right. <laughs> and then, uh, so Emmy was going to discuss my paper. So, okay, so, you know, when you're going on the job market, you're really attuned to any kind of feedback, like, is my life going to go like this? Is my life going to go like this? You know, how good is this paper? So I was really eager to kind of, you know, what is Emmy going to say about it in front of all these people? And I, I don't really remember anything she said about the paper, except that she called it radical. And I remember sitting in the audience saying, do I want to be radical? <laughs> and I still don't really know what she was talking about. With that. So, okay. So, so Emmy, Emmy has a lot of accomplishments and I'm sure many of you already know about them, but I'll tell you anyway. So Emmy is the Chancellor's Professor of Economics at the University of California at Berkeley. She's co-editor at the AER, co-director of the NBER Monetary Economics Program, and she received the Clark Medal in 2019. Um, so Emmy's research with John Steinson has been you know, very important in broadening the scope of methods and data that macroeconomists use. And this research agenda has addressed many important questions from you know, how we should discipline models of inflation, how we identify monetary shocks, how large are fiscal multipliers, and so many more, many more topics. So today she's going to discuss evidence on the Phillips curve from cross-sectional data. Sounds kind of radical. <laughs> so without further ado, I'll, I'll turn it over to Emmy. Thank you very much, Alistair, for that very gracious introduction. Um, and let me say that it's exciting to be here, even virtually, and you know, see everyone sitting together in this room together. 
Um, I can sort of feel the excitement of, of everyone being together again. And um, I, I'm, I'm certainly hoping that we're going to see much more of this over the next year or two. So um, with, that, um, with that brief introduction, um, let me say that um, so this paper is so this presentation is going to be about the Phillips curve, and I'm also going to touch more generally on, on some of these themes about how we can draw inference about aggregate questions from cross sectional data, which, as Alistair said, is something that uh, I've worked on quite a bit in the past as well. Um, but most of what I'm going to talk about is based on joint work uh, I've been doing with two of our students, um, Jonathan Hazel and Juan Jereno, who are now on their way to LSD, LSE and UCSD, respectively as well as John Steinson. So I'm going to talk about the Phillips curve, and I think uh, most of you know exactly what that is. Uh, there are many formulations of the Phillips curve, but here's one popular formulation of the Phillips curve. This is the New Keynesian Phillips curve. On the left hand side, we have inflation. On the right hand side, we have uh, three drivers, uh, expected inflation, unemployment relative to the natural rate, and uh, supply shocks. And of course, the supply shock term, I think, is something that has gotten a lot of attention just recently. I should mention that this topic of inflation, inflation dynamics, is something that we've been working on. This project is something that we've been working on for maybe a decade. You'll see that the data construction involved a lot of work, but it's been amazing just recently how much uh, these issues have been in the news. So what I'm going to be talking about is the slope of the Phillips curve. So the slope of the Phillips curve is this coefficient kappa on um, unemployment minus the natural rate on this unemployment gap. And so intuitively, this is telling us how much um, an increase in aggregate demand um, affects inflation. And the idea is that, you know, in principle, one would, one would like to be holding these other factors constant. So I think that the event that has probably most influenced American economists' views about the slope of the Phillips curve is probably the Volcker disinflation. Uh, so, you know, I'm sure you all know this story, but when Volcker comes into office, he raises interest rates. And the conventional story of this, of this event is that these high interest rates led to high unemployment. And in turn, high unemployment drove down inflation through a relatively steep Phillips curve. And this experience of a steep Phillips curve associated with the Volcker disinflation is something that is often contrasted with our experience of inflation in the last couple of decades. So in particular, during the Great Recession, even though we saw a very large increase in unemployment comparable to the increase in unemployment that occurred during the Volcker period. Uh, nevertheless, the decline in inflation was relatively muted. It was there, you know, it was, you know I'll show you later on that, that there is a systematic tendency for inflation to, to move with unemployment, but it was, it was much smaller. Um, so even though there was this big increase in unemployment compared to the, the Volcker uh, recession, the decline in inflation was much smaller. And analogously, one could say that the experience after the Great Recession um, was, um, was also associated with less of an increase in inflation than one might have expected from what happened during the Volcker period. So these experiences are often referred to as a missing disinflation during the Great Recession. And then one could say that there's a counterpart in terms of a missing reinflation following the Great Recession. And so, um, so there's a lot of, been a lot of discussion in the academic literature about whether these observations indicate that the Phillips curve is getting flatter, whether it's hibernating, or maybe whether it's completely dead. And there's a broader question as to whether this uh, apparent you know, flatness of the Phillips curve might uh, imply an important flaw in the Keynesian model. So just to uh, make these statements that I've been talking about more precise, um, let me consider a particular case just for expositional purposes, um, which is the case of adaptive expectations. So suppose that I replace this expectations term here with lagged inflation. In this case, um, I can rewrite the New Keynesian Phillips curve um, in this you know, very simple form that I'm sure you've seen before. So I, I replace this expected inflation term with lagged inflation, and then I move it over to the left-hand side. Uh, and if beta is, is close to one, then we get this expression here. Uh, which gives us, you know, sort of a very simple set of intuitions, which I think is the, the main one that people have, have thought about a lot in the context of, of the missing disinflation. And here we have on the left hand side, the change in inflation and on the right hand side, unemployment minus the natural rate. So I'm going to show you a picture that comes from Stock and Watson's 2019 Jackson Hole paper. 
And they're very careful about their language. So they're not going to refer to um, the, the relationship here as a slope of the Phillips curve because there are important identification issues that I'm going to talk more about. They are going to just refer to this relationship as the Phillips correlation, okay? Because, you know, it's just going to be a simple, um, simple correlation that I'm going to, to show you. And, you know, we're not going to be commenting yet about identification issues. And so the idea is to, to plot the change in 12-month uh, inflation, year-on-year -year change in inflation on the y-axis versus the unemployment gap on the x-axis using, this is just using the CBO's measure of the natural rate. And if you do this, uh, you see that there is this apparent flattening of the Phillips curve. So this is just a more quantitative version of what I've been talking about so far. So uh, the uh, circles are the data points from 1960 to 1983. The squares are the data points from 1984 to 1999. And uh, the diamonds are for the 2000s. And what it shows is that uh, while back in the 1960s and 1970s, it seems as though there was this fairly steep Phillips curve. As we move forward in time, the Phillips curve looks like it flattens. And then by the 2000s, it seems to be basically completely and so this is just a quantitative demonstration uh, of this uh, idea that I think uh, many people have talked about, that the Phillips curve is flattening. So there is an alternative interpretation for this set of facts. Uh, this explanation has been emphasized uh, in particular by Bernanke and Mishkin and goes by the name of the anchored expectations hypothesis. Um, and I'm going to try to be much more precise about what this anchored expectations hypothesis is later in the talk. But uh, the basic gist of the idea is to emphasize that the Volcker disinflation wasn't just associated with a big increase in unemployment that may have driven down inflation. But in addition to that, there was this massive regime change at the Fed at this time. And this big regime change led to uh, not only you know, an increase in interest rates and, 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 and the associated consequences for unemployment, but also a rapid fall in long-term inflation expectations. I'll show you a graph of this in a moment. And so according to this anchored expectations hypothesis, um, you know, there's this alternative idea that maybe it was the regime change and the effect on long-run inflation expectations that in fact played a dominant role in driving down inflation, as opposed to only a, start, a sharp, uh, a steep slope of the Phillips curve, you know, which is the explanation I talked about before. Um, so according to this explanation, maybe it was, it was the fact that in the early part of the sample period that I showed you in the graph, uh, there was this regime change going on, whereas since 1990, long-run inflation expectations have been uh, very stable, and there, and there wasn't this uh, big regime change that, that leads to this apparent flattening of the Phillips curve. And just to, to show you, you know, a piece of corroborating evidence uh, for this uh, perspective, here's a graph of long-run inflation expectations. You can see that back in the 1980s, um, long-run inflation expectations, which is the, the gray line here, at many points moved almost one for one with uh, the black line here, which is core CPI inflation. But uh, once you get to the late 1990s, around 1998, you see that long-run inflation expectations almost completely stabilize uh, around 2%. Uh, there, there are some movements uh, and, and, you know, the, the movements we see, you know, get a lot of press, particularly recently, but you see, you know, it's really very stable compared to what we saw in the 1980s and the 1990s. And so this is sort of consistent uh, with the idea that um, the regime change that occurred around 1980 really did have a big impact. And, you know, you know maybe people were learning about it, in fact, for, for, for many years after that. Now, you know, these seem like, you know, two different stories. And I'm going to do a lot more to try to be very explicit about what the what the different stories are. So if it's still a little fuzzy to you what I mean by um, the, the expectations channel versus a steep Phillips curve, I'm going to try to be much more precise about that. Um, but for now, let me just say, so there are these two stories on the on the table. Uh, was it a steep Phillips curve or, or was it the role of, of this anchoring ex of expectations that was the crucial driver? And it's very challenging to figure out uh, the answer to this using aggregate data. And I think that this is a lot of why the Phillips curve literature is so old, um, because it is just a really empirically challenging um, literature when one is looking at aggregate data to try to distinguish the effects of inflation expectations 
um, you know, this, this demand channel and, and, and supply shocks. Uh, and, and there are several empirical challenges, really. So, so one that I've been emphasizing so far is that you could have movements in inflation expectations and that these movements in inflation expectations might co-vary with the variation in demand shocks that you're really trying to estimate the effects of. Um, and, and that's exactly the kind of channel that I'm going to be emphasizing a lot with regard to what happened after Volcker entered office. Now, there is you know, a potential way of addressing this by controlling for inflation expectations in some way. For example, there's a large literature thinking about using rational expectations as a way for controlling for inflation expectations. But this is also very challenging. Um, you know, there, there are weak instruments, difficulties with trying to control for, for, for uh, inflation expectations using rational expectations that are, for example, detailed in this paper by Mavaridis et al. So that's one important empirical challenge that I'm going to talk a lot about, this problem of you know, what you might call um, omitted variables bias, essentially, associated with this inflation expectations term. And again, if this is still feeling kind of fuzzy, because maybe you're thinking, well, um, one period inflation expectations, it's going to be correlated with this aggregate demand term. So is it really a, a separate factor? Aren't they really the same factor? If those are kind of concerns that are arising in your mind, I'm going to be much more explicit about what I mean about these two channels in a, in a moment. A second issue um, that arises in trying to estimate the slope of the Phillips curve is the classic issue of trying to distinguish between the effects of demand and supply shocks. So in this Phillips curve equation, we have both. Uh, we have the effect of these aggregate demand shocks, and we also have these supply shocks. And there's this problem uh, that, that, that both of these, supply, these, these types of shocks are present. Then running a regression and looking at the coefficient of the regression is not necessarily going to tell us, for example, the slope of, uh, of the Phillips curve. And this is exactly the same problem that occurs um, you know, more generally in the case of, of trying to estimate the slope of a demand or a supply curve. Um, the, the incidence of this problem in, in the particular case of monetary policy has been, um, you know, emphasized and, and sort of elucidated in, in recent work by both Fitzgerald uh, and Nicolini and McLean and, and Tenrero, where they point out that if you have good monetary policy in a simple model, then good monetary policy can actually offset all the variation in inflation associated with demand shocks. So in that situation, the monetary policy is actually going to eliminate all of the good kind of variation, good in the sense that it, it could be useful in estimating the slope of the Phillips curve. And the only kind of variation that's going to be left over is the supply shock variation, um, which is the bad kind of variation from the perspective of estimating the slope of the Phillips curve. And so that, that would be the exact work, worst case scenario in terms of this identification problem of demand versus supply shocks. So given all these challenges uh, in using aggregate data to estimate the slope of the Phillips curve, one question one can, one can ask, and that's, that's what, what we've been thinking about, um, is whether cross-sectional panel data could be helpful in trying to um, establish additional evidence on the slope of the Phillips curve. And so there's been um, a recent and, and I think very interesting literature that has been uh, trying to um, address these kinds of questions, um, you know, one of the seminal papers being this Fitzgerald and, and Nicolini paper. One of the points that this literature has emphasized is this endogeneity point, that at the aggregate level, at least in a simple model, where monetary policy can, um, can offset all of the variation in inflation associated with demand shocks, then you have this sort of perfect storm from the perspective of identification, because there's just no variation associated with demand left to identify the slope of the Phillips curve. And so in that context, uh, they emphasize, um, along with McLean and Tenrero, that, um, that regional data could be very helpful because while aggregate monetary policy could offset, at least in principle, in a simple model, all of the variation um, associated with demand shocks at the aggregate level, this wouldn't be possible at the regional level because you, know, you only have one interest rate and you can't set it differently in California and uh, New York. So if there are different demand shocks in California versus New York, then you're not going to be able to perfectly offset them. So that's one kind of argument for, um, for why uh, regional data might be helpful that this literature has emphasized. A second kind of argument is just that there is more variation at the regional level uh, than at the aggregate level. There, there, there are uh, states that have some additional recessions. I'll show you that Texas is an additional, uh, an interesting example of that. There are also differences in incidence of, of recessions across states, um, and all of that uh, might add some additional variation that, that can help us 
get a more precise read on this. In addition to this, uh, we emphasize um, this, um, this other, other force that I was describing earlier, having to do with the potential role of regional data in helping to address uh, the effects of expectations and the confounding effects of expectations in estimating the slope of Phillips curve. And again, I'll be much more specific about that. So what I'm gonna do is, is first, I'm going to talk about just how to think about uh, the cross-sectional evidence on inflation relative to unemployment. Um, in relation to these aggregate Phillips curve questions that we want to know the answer to. And this is related to these broader questions um, that uh, John and I have been working on for, for some time, having to do with, you know, what can we learn uh, from cross-sectional evidence about the aggregate? You know, as macroeconomists, we only have, uh, if we're only going to look at aggregate data, we have, you know, a limited number of, of, of data points, a um, num limited number of recessions and so on. And there's this question of how much we can expand the scope of the evidence we have by using regional data. But, but there are real questions about um, how analogous the experiments are that we see in the regional data versus the aggregate data. And so we're going to develop a model to try to shed some light on that. And we're going to show um, that, in fact, at least in a, in a simple sort of benchmark case, the slope of the Phillips curve at the regional level really is very informative about the slope of the Phillips curve at the aggregate level. It's not exactly the same. You'll see there's gonna be an additional term, but it's very informative. And in fact, the slope is the same uh, in, a simple, in a simple model. And then uh, to uh, apply this, um, this equation that we derive uh, from this model, we're going to develop some new data. It's an idiosyncrasy of the US statistical system that there haven't been state level inflation indexes. So people have had to do various uh, things to try to come up with some analog to that. And uh, we are going to uh, use the micro data to construct state level non-tradable inflation indexes. I emphasize non-tradable because as you'll see in this model, it's really crucial uh, to focus on non-tradable inflation in thinking about uh, the evidence that we have from the regional data. So let me uh, start by just talking conceptually um, in more detail and precision about what I mean when I say that um, changes in the monetary regime or in long run inflation expectations can confound our estimation of the slope of the Phillips curve. So I'm gonna start from um, this original uh, New Keynesian Phillips curve equation I had at the beginning and that I'm sure you, uh, many of you have seen many times before. So I just have inflation on the left-hand side and then I have expected inflation and unemployment minus the natural rate on the right-hand side and then this supply shock term. And then I solve it forward. So I'm just going to recursively substitute in inflation um, or expected inflation here on the right hand side. And I get this equation at the bottom here, where um, you get this sort of intuitive conclusion that inflation is a function of uh, two things. One is the discounted present value of unemployment. So it's not just whether you're in a recession now, but whether you're going to be in recession for, for, for many quarters or, or multiple years. And then this supply shock term, which uh, is going to combine the effects of both the supply shock I had in the original equation and the natural rate of unemployment. So this is just you know, giving you this dynamic conclusion that inflation isn't just a function of, of current unemployment, but it's, it's a function of, of where, things, where people think things are going over the next several years. Now I'm going to do one more uh, thing. So I, I just want to emphasize this is all just simple algebraic manipulation. So if something I say goes by quickly, uh, trust me, I'm not doing anything uh, particularly sophisticated. I'm just sort of moving around terms in this very standard equation. Um, now I'm going to do one more thing, which is to uh, decompose unemployment into two components. A cyclical component, which I'm just defining as the deviation of unemployment from a long run value of unemployment. And then this long run term that has to do with this, uh, this long run expectation. So I can you know, just substitute in this decomposition to get these two terms. Uh, and then I'm going to use uh, a feature of this new Keynesian Phillips curve, which is that there is this relationship between long run unemployment expectations and long run inflation expectations. Once I do that substitution, then I get this last equation, which I think is, is fairly intuitive and which maybe uh, some of you actually teach something like this um, if you teach um, monetary policy in undergraduate classes. So, so here's what this equation says. It has uh, inflation on the left-hand side, then it has this discounted present value 
of um, cyclical unemployment, unemployment uh, deviations from this long run value. And then it has this term, which is the, the long run inflation expectation. So you can think about this as the inflation target of the central bank. And then finally, uh, the, the, the supply shock term. One thing to emphasize this uh, derivation, even though it's really just you know, simple algebraic manipulations, it was a little bit involved. If instead you assume beta equals one, then you can go just immediately from this equation uh, as you recursively uh, substitute in for, uh, for inflation here to this last equation here, because you can immediately see in the beta equals one case that this long run inflation expectations term is not going to drop out. So uh, the, the complications of, of this derivation to the extent that there are a few are, are just showing that there's no discontinuity at beta equals one. So now one more thing, just for expositional purposes, we aren't going to make this assumption in, in, in the analysis that we do, uh, suppose that the cyclical component of unemployment was an air one process. Then we could replace this infinite sum uh, using the usual, um, the usual formula for infinite sums, where rho is the persistence of cyclical unemployment. And we would get this last expression here, where you have inflation on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, the cyclical value of unemployment now, not multiplied by kappa anymore, which was the slope of the Phillips curve, but now by this, by this um, uh, formula that's a function of kappa, where it's a scaled value of kappa, and the scaling factor depends on the persistence of unemployment. So this is just this intuitive idea that kappa is a coefficient in front of this whole discounted present value of cyclical unemployment. So it's saying that, you know, if you're in you know, 2009 and unemployment is really high, then inflation is going to be low. There's a negative sign here. But it's not just because of the fact that, um, that unemployment is high now. It's because you know, there is some persistence of recessions. And, uh, and that means you know, through this row term here that the coefficient psi is going to be bigger than the coefficient kappa. And then finally, um, this long run inflation expectations term, which you can think of as the inflation target of the central bank and the supply shock term. So now we have, um, you know, a, a fairly simple um, expression, you know, something that you can think about analyzing in the, in, in the data in principle. And uh, I want to use it to kind of uh, make it more quantitatively clear what I mean when I say that, you know, there are these different channels one could think about for fluctuations in inflation. One channel is the slope of the Phillips curve um, that we often talk about. And that relates to this coefficient psi, which remember is a scaled, um, scaled value of, of kappa. But there's also this other term, um, the long run inflation expectations term. And notice that no matter how small the slope of the Phillips curve is, so no, no matter how small the psi is here, the coefficient on this long run inflation expectations term is actually one. And you know this is this is you know, not a new message. Uh, it's closely related, for example, to the points that um, Sargent made in his book on the end of, of, of hyperinflations. This is just uh, pointing out that um, if people believe that inflation is going to fall dramatically in the future, for example, because of a change in the monetary regime, then then there can be big changes in this long run inflation expectations term, and that can lead current inflation to change even if nothing is going on with the slope of the Phillips curve um, or with the current value of cyclical unemployment. And you can see now you know, what I mean when I say that there's this big confounding factor, because in principle, inflation could vary associated with this long run inflation expectations term, even with no variation in the cyclical unemployment term. So potentially, if there is a correlation, for example, between the long run inflation expectations term and unemployment, the cyclical value of unemployment, like, you know, uh, as, I'll, as I'll argue there was in the Volcker disinflation period, then this would be a, a source of severe omitted variables bias, because maybe you're going to think that um, this reflects a very steep slope of the Phillips curve, a very high value of the psi term here, when in fact, the changes in inflation are truly coming from uh, this long run inflation expectations term. So this is um, a really important empirical problem, I think, and, and one that we're gonna argue uh, the, the, the cross-sectional regional data has some potential to help addressing. Just to sort of uh, drive home this point uh, that um, it's been said before that this long run inflation expectations term 
can be important. Here I'm showing you a picture of, um, of, of a hyperinflation, the end of a hyperinflation. You've probably seen these pictures before. Um, the price level here on the, on the y-axis is in logs. So these are truly gigantic increases in the price level that we're talking about. Uh, but then you see uh, this very rapid uh, end of the hyperinflation. It doesn't happen gradually, it happens rapidly. Um, and I think that, you know, generally speaking, when we talk about these kinds of events, uh, we, we, we talk very little about the slope of the Phillips curve, and we mostly talk about um, these long-run inflation expectation uh, term. Now, of course, the, the Volcker, the, the, the inflation that the United States had in the 1970s was not by any uh, definition hyperinflation. Uh, but uh, we're going to argue that, that similar forces are, are nevertheless important. There was this sharp shift in the monetary regime, and building on this kind of equation, you can see that there's this alternative possible interpretation of what happened that doesn't involve the steep slope of the Phillips curve, but rather involves a, a drop in inflation associated with uh, a big change or big regime change in the Fed that led to a big decline in long run inflation expectations. Whereas in contrast, in the period since the 1990s, inflation expectations have been much more firmly anchored. One digression before I, I move on to the empirical evidence, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to next present um, you know, a model of the regional data and try to argue that the regional data can help us to distinguish between these different potential theories. Um, but let me say one more thing which, before I do that. Uh, which is a, a, a small digression on um, inflation measures of inflation and inflation expectations. So going back uh, for a moment to the original formulation of the Phillips curve, which wasn't solved forward. If I, if I write out that new Keynesian Phillips curve and take the one period ahead inflation expectations term over to the left hand side, then I get this expression, which has the gap between inflation and one period ahead inflation expectations on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, I have the gap in unemployment relative to the natural rate. And so what I want to talk briefly about is what this gap between inflation and inflation expectations looks like in the data, because there's a sense in which uh, this gap is what uh, the, the slope of the Phillips curve could potentially um, be able to explain. Uh, and if we graph this in the data, so here's uh, a graph of, of inflation is the black line here. And the gray line is the one year ahead survey of professional forecasters forecast of inflation. You see that with the standard measures that people often use, so this is CPI inflation and one year ahead survey of professional forecasters forecast, uh, it looks like there is a pretty substantial gap between inflation and, and one year ahead inflation expectations, and that this gap is particularly large in the uh, pre-1990 period. So that might be sort of consistent with the view that there was more for the slope of the Phillips curve to explain before 1990 than after 1990, and that there is in fact a substantial amount for the slope of the Phillips curve to explain. Now one factor could be uh, supply shocks, because in this equation I do have this um, supply shock term here. So um, one way of partially um, ameliorating that concern is to, to move from CPI inflation to core CPI inflation. And if we do that, uh, these lines are a little bit closer together. So, um, so there's a smaller gap between the two, but it remains the case that the difference between um, you know, inflation and one period ahead inflation expectations is significant and it, and it looks larger uh, before 1990 than after 1990. So there's you know, some daylight between these lines and particularly before 1990. But there's this important measurement issue that I sort of want to advertise regarding the data, which is that before 1983, um, the CPI was, was constructed in a fairly different way uh, in regards to particularly the housing services. So it used to be that housing services were constructed uh, in an ad hoc way from sort of an average of house prices and mortgage costs. Mortgage costs means basically interest rates. So before 1983, um, interest rates were going directly into the CPI. And as you might know, the CPI uh, is uh, one of the data series constructed by the government, which is never revised because it goes into union contracts and, and so it just can't be backward revised. So in fact, um, in fact, the, the, the CPI that you would download uh, from the BLS website, it still has this feature in terms of how um, housing services were constructed before 1983. Since 1983, the BLS has kind of realized that this wasn't a great way of constructing the inflation index. And so they've switched to a rental equivalence method. 
for constructing um, inflation. But in the standard CPI, there's this important break in the data construction in 1983. And it turns out that this is really quite important. So when you switch from uh, the standard you know, measure core CPI inflation to uh, measures that, uh, that, that actually are updated to use modern methods before 1983, you see that uh, now these lines lie right on top of each other. So this is true both with core PCE or the VLS also releases a version of the CPI measure that is backward updated using modern methods. And you see using either of these methods, there's no daylight anymore between inflation and, and one period ahead inflation expectations. This difference is essentially zero. And you know, I, I don't want to argue that this is strong evidence uh, in favor of this hypothesis. You know, there are various uh, concerns you might have uh, with this, but but certainly it sort of passes the smell test that uh, in fact this slope of the Phillips curve may may be small and, and may have been small even back in the 1980s. And and I and I do want to highlight that I think this is an important data issue. Okay, so let me move on now to a model of, of the regional Phillips curve, because I want to present this regional data as more convincing evidence, uh, trying to distinguish between these different theories about what, what drove inflation in the 1980s. So the model is going to be a, a very uh, standard model. Um, of course, I'm not going to have time to, to go through the details, but there are going to be two regions, a home and a foreign region a tradable and non-tradable sector in each region. We're going to make some stark assumptions. Um, and you know, this is not to say that, that these assumptions are, are totally realistic, but rather we're going to try to construct sort of a benchmark case, a simple case in which we can think about these issues analytically and you know, just understand conceptually what the relationship would be between the regional and the aggregate Phillips curve. So we're going to assume that there's no labor mobility between regions but there's perfect labor mobility within sectors uh, within a region. And then finally, and importantly, we're going to assume that this is a monetary union. And this is really a crucial assumption because um, a big thing that we're going to play on is the idea that if there's a change in the monetary regime, for example, a change in the inflation target, then that's going to affect both the home and the foreign um, region in the same way in the long run. So uh, in terms of the, the, the details of the model, um, the households, it's, it's all very standard on both the household and the firm side, um, with the possible exception of, you know, the, the most tractable case for analyzing this question turns out to be one with GHH preferences. Um, and on the firm side, we're going to assume Calvo type price regime. So out of this uh, mostly very standard model, we derive a regional Phillips curve uh, for non-tradables and an aggregate Phillips curve. Uh, so let me first talk about this issue of non-tradables versus tradables. So one thing that comes out of the model, uh, but I think you'll find fairly intuitive, is that if one is going to estimate regional Phillips curves, it's really important to focus on non-tradables. So what's the intuition for that? Well, think about a tradable, like say gasoline. Suppose the price of the gasoline is the same in you know, the different regions. Then if you, if you run a panel regression and you include time fixed effects, then no matter how responsive the gasoline prices are to the state of the economy, they're the same in the different regions. So these time fixed effects are going to pick up all of the variation. And there's not going to be any uh, differential variation between the, the prices in the two regions to identify the slope of the Phillips curve. And so you're, you're, you're not going to actually get any information uh, from, from, from tradables. And to the extent that you include them in your regressions, it's going to bias the estimates towards zero. So that's one sort of intuitive conclusion that comes out of this analysis that the information that we're going to get on the slope of the Phillips curve from the regional data is going to be information that comes from non-tradables because it's, it's going to be important that the prices are set separately in the different regions. Um, so a second thing is that if we compare the regional and aggregate Phillips curve, you see that there are some important similarities. So it has, you know, we have the same terms here, uh, same three terms here. Uh, and uh, in particular, the slope of the Phillips curve is actually the same. This kappa slope is the same between the regional and the aggregate Phillips curve. Now, as I said, this is like a simple benchmark case. You saw that I made some pretty stark assumptions. But given these stark assumptions, there is, um, as I emphasized uh, earlier, a close link uh, between the slope of the regional Phillips curve and uh, the slope of the aggregate Phillips curve. Now, there is an additional term in uh, the regional Phillips curve, and we refer to this as a terms of trade term. 
It turns out that this is not empirically very important because, um, you know, consistent with our conclusions about kappa, it turns out that this slope on this terms of trade term is very small. And so from an empirical standpoint, it doesn't matter very much. But theoretically, this extra term is pretty important uh, because really, um, you know, this is the term that basically has to do with PPP. Um, it's the term that leads to, you know, brings us back to um, PPP in the long run, and it's the term that sort of makes the model make sense um, in terms of in terms of the regional Phillips curve. So we so we have this additional term. Um, but you know, the things I want to emphasize. So so there 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 are, there are some differences, but there's also this important analogy between uh, the two uh, Phillips curves, and this is what we're going to draw on in trying to use regional data to to learn something about the slope of the aggregate Phillips curve. Now, um, now that I have this regional Phillips curve, I can do a sort of similar solving forward exercise as what I did with the aggregate Phillips curve, um, where I saw forward and then like I did before, I decompose unemployment into this cyclical component and this long run component. And then I end up uh, with, you know, similar to what I had before with this expression that has long run inflation expectations in it. And now we get to what we see as one of the main advantages of using the regional data, which is that uh, if you now think of, of, of estimating this equation in regional data, you would include a time fixed effect. And this time fixed effect is going to absorb um, a large amount of variation associated with long run inflation expectations. And, you know, when I when you work with this data, this is not just an abstract thing. If you look at data on inflation for different states in the 1980s, there's a huge common component that has to do with uh, the Volcker disinflation, which had you know, a lot of common incidents across states. So this is a really large uh, fraction of the variation in the data for the early part of the sample period. And so a lot of that's gonna be absorbed by this time fixed effect. And the remaining variation, which is gonna, um, going to uh, identify the slope of the Phillips curve is going to have to do with the differential variation across states, as opposed to this common component, which is going to be absorbed by this time fixed effect. So now, uh, one last thing, um, which I think is sort of useful in thinking about this literature more broadly and how it relates to the aggregate uh, literature. Again, just for expositional purposes, suppose that we assume that this, um, this cyclical component of unemployment is an AR1 process. Then we could replace um, this infinite sum by this expression here with a psi coefficient instead of a kappa coefficient on cyclical unemployment. And we would get an expression that looks like the kind of expression that has often been estimated in this recent literature on regional Phillips curve. So this is kind of the type of expression that's often been emphasized in the recent literature, although often or, or typically this terms of trade term is not included. Um, but, but the thing I want to emphasize is that this coefficient psi, um, though it's, it's closely related to the coefficient kappa, it's not the same thing. And the crucial difference is that the psi is incorporating the effects of the persistence in the unemployment rate. So it's, 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 uh, the, the magnitude of, of psi is not just determined by how steep the slope of the Phillips curve is, it's also determined by how long you think a given recession is likely to last. And you know, to the extent that unemployment is persistent, and we know it is persistent, then generally speaking, the psi is going to be much larger than the cap. The reason I'm belaboring this sort of very pedestrian point is that in practice, uh, in this uh, applied literature where people have been estimating the slope of the Phillips curve and often actually finding relative to the aggregate literature, um, higher estimates of the slope of the Phillips curve, um, we, we want to emphasize that this is an important difference uh, in comparing the two. So it is, it's sometimes been said that the regional Phillips curves literature has been, has been getting much steeper slopes than the aggregate Phillips curve literature and that this is a puzzle or there's a question as to why we're getting higher numbers from the, the regional Phillips curve literature than the aggregate Phillips curve literature. And we want to emphasize that there's this important issue of definition uh, that you can see um, when you work through this model and uh, that generically, even for the same structural value of this parameter kappa, you would expect the psi to be much larger. Um, and in fact, we're going to argue that once you adjust for this, uh, the estimate from the regional Phillips curve literature is going to be quite similar. Uh, to, to, to what people have found in the aggregate literature. So now let me talk briefly about the data. Um, as I mentioned briefly at the beginning, there's an idiosyncrasy of the US statistical system that there aren't any existing state level inflation indexes. This has to do with the fact that 
The DLS um, has tended to be very careful about not releasing uh, data that has too much um, uh, sort of sampling error in it. And, and so they haven't wanted to release state level indexes, even though um, the underlying microdata is, is there. But since we're going to be running regressions, you know, I think they've, I think they've been worried that you know, users wouldn't understand this fully. Since we're going to be running regressions, you know, this, this sampling error is just going to end up in the error term. And so one of the things we do is we construct these state level inflation indexes from the underlying BLS microdata. We're going to do this separately for tradables and non-tradables. I've emphasized that this distinction is, is very important uh, when one is working with the uh, regional Phillips curves. And our hope is that these state level inflation indexes will be useful beyond our project uh, for, for other projects in which uh, state level price indexes are needed. So just to, to you know, show you that our, 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 um, you know, our, our, our indexes are able to do a reasonable job at approximating the official indexes, uh, this is a plot of our replication of uh, the CPI versus the official index. The main part to probably look at is the pre-1988 part, because this is the part of the data that we uh, recovered from microfilm in an earlier project. And so it's reassuring that we sort of you know, get, get a pretty close approximation to the official series, particularly for this period of time. What is the variation that we're using to estimate um, the, the slope of the Phillips curve? Well, um, as I said, in the, the method we're using, we're going to be taking out the aggregate component, the common component, which you know, we're, we're concerned is confounded by these uh, regime changes and so on. And so the variation we're going to be using is the differential variation in unemployment across states to identify the slope of the Phillips curve. And so it's useful to kind of look at a few states and get a sense of what this variation is. Here I'm showing you um, the unemployment rate for Pennsylvania um, California and Texas, and you see, you know, Texas has this extra recession here um, in the 1980s, presumably because it's an oil state. Another, uh, an, an, another example of the kind of variation we're using, um, the Great Recession had much bigger incidence in California relative to the two other states. So now let me show you uh, some results. Um, so we are going to estimate this regional Phillips curve. This is the the structural equation I showed you earlier. Um, also for comparability to uh, the prior literature, which has done this, but in a less structural way, we're going to estimate um, a reduced form equation here, um, which you know, one way of interpreting it is, is, is as viewing uh, unemployment as an air one process. Uh, but but I'll, I think I'll, you know, for the, for the sake of time, I'll just focus on the, the structural estimates kappa where we're not making those assumptions about the dynamics of, of unemployment. How, how do we, what are the mechanics of how we estimate kappa? I'm not going to have time to go into the details of this, but we're going to use, um, you know, a standard GMM procedure to estimate kappa. The only tricky thing that comes up here is the fact that um, you know, we have to account for the fact that unemployment is persistent. So it's this discounted present value here that appears in the equation. And, and so this is where we're going to use this, this GMM procedure. But it turns out this procedure has a very close relationship with the reduced form approaches that have been used in the literature before. In terms of identification, there's this problem of demand versus supply shocks. Um, you know, this, this a fundamental question in economics sort of similar to the to the estimating the slope of demand versus supply curves we're going to use two approaches to dealing with this um, one is we're going to include time and state fixed effects so this will hopefully capture some of the supply shock variation and the second is that we're going to come up with this um, new instrument using the regional variation again I, I won't have time to go into this in detail but but for those of you who are familiar with this it's sort of uh, similar to a Bartik instrument a shift share instrument. And the intuition is going to be uh, to use uh, aggregate shocks at the tradable level and think about their incidence on the non-tradable sector. So the idea is going to be, suppose you have an, an oil boom at the aggregate level. It's true that that's a supply shock. Um, but if you think about the differential effect of rest on restaurants in, say, Texas versus New York, um, assuming that the restaurant technology is not different in Texas versus New York, then it's going to look like a demand shock for Texan restaurants. And then we're going to make some, some sort of standard assumptions about how we define variables. Um, so what do we get out of this? Um, 
at the full sample level, I think the first conclusion is um, that it really makes a huge difference to include the time fixed effects, which are accounting for this common component um, that has to do, um, among other things, with changes in long run inflation expectations and regime change. So if we estimate the, the, the model um, without state effects, we, we actually get the wrong sign. Uh, so it's a negative number. In our parameterization, this slope of the Phillips curve is supposed to be a positive number. We get basically zero if we have state effects, but no time fixed effects. Uh, but once we include both state and time fixed effects, then we get, um, you know, we get significant uh, positive um, coefficients here, which corresponds to a, a negative slope of the Phillips curve. Now, perhaps more interesting is to, to think about the difference between the first and the second half of the sample period. If we don't include the time fixed effects, then we estimate this massive flattening uh, of the Phillips curve. This is sort of analogous to what I talked about at the beginning um, with Stock and Watson's Phillips correlation. It's a, it's a flattening of the factor of about 100. Um, but in contrast, once we do include time fixed effects, we find a flattening of only about a factor of, of a half. And this is sort of uh, comparable to um, what one finds uh, in terms of the decline in the frequency of price change between the first half and the second half of the sample. We find very similar results in terms of the magnitude of the flattening uh, using our two identification approaches. Here's uh, what I was saying in a graphical uh, form. So if we don't include the time fixed effects, then there's this massive amount of flattening. We go from a very steep uh, Phillips curve for the pre-1990 period to uh, basically a, a Phillips curve with a slope of zero. When we add these time fixed effects, then uh, we have this much more moderate uh, flattening, of about a factor of 0.5. Um, so the, the last thing that I want to talk about is the extent to which um, these cross-sectional estimates of the slope of the Phillips curve are consistent with and can help interpret the aggregate time series data. And because this relates to the question of just whether, you know, whether are the estimates that we're finding, are they indicating a steep or flat Phillips curve? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the um, slope from the regional data, the kappa, our structural estimates of kappa. Um, and then there's one more parameter that we have to estimate having to do with the persistence of unemployment. And then I'm going to just plug in aggregate data on, um, on the unemployment gap. And I'm going to ask how much of the variation in inflation minus long-term inflation expectations can um, our estimates and model explain, um, given the estimates we have from the cross-sectional data. One thing to note is that this analysis includes rent. We kind of do the whole analysis I described before, um, including, including rent. Um, and, 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 and it's important to mention that because rent is particularly cyclical. So here's what we get from, from this analysis. The, the, the black line is the data on inflation minus long-term inflation expectations. Um, and the first thing I want to mention is just the small amplitude of the variation. So um, you know, there was a lot of variation in inflation over this period. But once you take out long-term inflation expectations, you see that the amplitude of the fluctuations is much smaller. Um, most of the graph is, you know, lies somewhere between one and, and minus one. So a huge part of the variation in inflation that we've seen has to do with these long-term inflation expectations. The second thing to mention is that for the post-1990 period, if you look at the data, uh, the black line, you know, you do see this modest cyclicality. Uh, you know, after the Great Recession, inflation uh, relative to long-term inflation expectations fell and it rose a little bit. You know, same thing after the 2001 recession. Uh, same thing here. So there is this modest cyclicality, and in fact, this modest cyclicality is, is, is captured, you know, in, in broad outlines and qualitatively at least by, um, by, the, by the slope of the fields we estimate from uh, the regional data, which is this gray line. And in particular, if you look at the, the Great Recession, you know, there isn't a sense in which uh, there's a missing disinflation, at least relative to our estimates, um, we, we, we end up with an estimate that's fairly close to the data. Actually, um, the, the Place where our um, where this you know simple calculation really misses is in the pre 1990 period where you see that um, there's this actually inflation is much higher than long run inflation expectations but according to a simple Phillips curve cut kind of analysis you you wouldn't you can't come to that conclusion because unemployment was also really high during that period so the period where you really need something else to augment the model 
um, is actually the pre-1990 period. And the natural interpretation is that that, that has to do with supply shocks. You know, we know that there were large supply shocks during this period, oil shocks and so on. And, and this analysis suggests that that's really important in explaining the pre-1990 period. So the last thing I want to say, um, you know, I've, I've been emphasizing very much the role of inflation, long run inflation expectations. But one thing I haven't said anything interesting about is um, how these long run inflation expectations uh, change. So, you know, this is, I think, an important topic of research. There's a lot of interesting research about it. Um, but, I, but I think it's probably an area where even more research could be done. So how does the central bank convince people that what it says is credible? Um, we know that a lot of times it seems that people don't pay much attention, but we also know that at some times, um, long run beliefs about the long run do change rapidly. Um, so among these events, the Volcker disinflation or the ends of hyperinflations, like the graph of Bolivia that I showed you earlier on. So, you know, an important question is what distinguishes between these situations. In the particular case of Volcker, you know, I've emphasized this idea that there's this confounding force that unemployment was high. And so maybe it looks like a steep slope of the Phillips curve, but there was this other thing going on that there was this big change in the monetary regime. Um, so one question you might ask is, you know, am, am I saying that's an accident? Was that just random that they haven't happened at, at the same time? And, and I would say, no, uh, I don't think it's an accident. Um, how did the Fed uh, develop this um, increased level of credibility? Well, Volcker comes in, he causes this massive recession, and then perhaps somewhat amazingly, um, you know, he, 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 he doesn't get fired. In fact, people knew that he was going to do this before he was appointed. He was still appointed. Um, he manages to stay, you know, in, in office and so on. And, um, and, and undoubtedly, this had a major impact on the credibility of the Fed and the strength of the institution. But the idea that this was very important uh, from the perspective of changing beliefs about the institution, the stability of the institution, um, is, is quite different from the standard uh, interpretation that inflation fell because of a steep Phillips curve holding fixed um, the, the, the long run inflation expectations associated with uh, the institution. So uh, let, me, let me stop there. Um, our main conclusion is that the slope of the Phillips curve has, has been small in the sense that it's consistent with the, the relatively muted fluctuations in inflation we've seen relative to unemployment in the recent period, uh, even back in the 1980s. Uh, and that the crucial thing in the Volcker disinflation was not so much a, a much steeper Phillips curve, but rather um, the, the changes in, in beliefs about long run inflation expectations that happened at that time. Thank you. Wait, 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 wait. This one might. That one, that one doesn't work. Can you hear it? It'll help with the floor to zoom. Okay. Uh, I have a question. I'm surprised to hear you say you think the slope of the Phillips curve is so low. Uh, I mean, if we look back at, let's say, the Great Depression, um, then there's a huge fall in prices. I think it was essentially the gold standard at that time. So people's long run inflation expectations must have been pretty constant, uh, certainly early in the Great Depression. So, I mean, do you think the slope of the Phillips curve was bigger then than it is later? It's possible. So I, I, I know that that's uh, a view held by my, my colleagues, Christy and David Romer. I, I haven't analyzed the data from that period, so I don't know. Um, my, my thoughts on this are, are really just driven by what we found about um, the behavior of inflation relative to unemployment for this period since uh, since 1977. So my question is about the relationship with uh, issues about nominal frictions. So suppose uh, I play Davis advocate and I think of a model where there are no nominal frictions. Um, then in the aggregate, I would see no relationship between uh, uh, inflation and unemployment which can either come in the form of a perfectly flat or perfectly steep. I mean, it's going to be a cloud both ways. But then when I look across states, I'm looking at a, a relative price variation. There I would expect to see something. And so, you know, what you're capturing, if you're identifying demand shocks, what you're capturing is the elasticity of the local supply of restaurants. So how do I go from 
the price of money versus goods to the relative price of restaurants in New York versus Texas? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And then one that we spent a lot of time thinking about. And I think, you know, one of the prime values of, of, of writing down this kind of model. So those kinds of effects, you know, related to velocity Samuelson effects and so on are present in our model. And in fact, as as prices get more flexible, what happens is that um, there are bigger responses of inflation um, to these kinds of differences in demand, both at the regional and the aggregate level. So one can actually analyze quantitatively what one would expect in, in terms of the relative price responses in one state versus another if there were no price rigidity. And it, it relates to the coefficient on what I call the terms of trade term. And that coefficient would be very large in the scenario with no price rigidity. And in fact, in the data, it's very small, consistent with what we find um, about the slope, uh, you know, about the Kappa parameter. So, um, so, so, so certainly the forces you're describing are there, but the implications in terms of the magnitude of the coefficients are very different from, from what we find in the data. Okay, so thanks a lot, Emmy. Um, and we have a few words from Ellen. Yeah, thanks. Can you guys hear me in the back? Can you hear me on Zoom, Emmy? I want to take the opportunity because many are flying home for uh, July 4th to, to thank. Um, so many people helped out with this. And first, I want to. I'm hoping Nir and Duran are looking at me. <laughs> I'm talking right to you. I'm right to you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so it's easy to get people to sign up to do the program chairing in Barcelona. What they didn't realize was they were going to do for years and years, <laughs> two programs. Uh, so we started at 504 and all were headed to Barcelona before COVID hit. And now we're at 726 plus many additional Zoomers because, because we had the uh, Zoom option. The amount of work it goes in to put a program together like this, it's insane. And then everybody canceling at the last minute and moving things around. and. So thank you. Uh, on the other side are all the many people who are here who uh, I'm getting a little, a little emotional because it's been a long time. We, we've been doing this. Hey, for... I want to speak into the microphone. Okay, but then I'll like get all emotional into the microphone. So we learned last fall that, um, you know, it was clear we couldn't go to Barcelona and what other group of people could put together a conference like that, uh, like this, but the Minnesotans? <laughs> we have energetic faculty, and I want to uh, say Anmal and Kyle and Hannes and Joe, thank you. the best graduate students in the world. And the best staff. I cannot. There's one person in particular who actually her job before this was to watch over ninth graders in a high school. We're much harder than ninth graders in high school. Um, uh, thank you. Sorry. So now I'll turn to a couple logistics um, before closing it off and thanking Emmy again. Um, we're going to order more of these really cool t-shirts. <laughs> so if anybody wants them, and I'll send you a free one to me for doing such a good job. Um, if anybody wants them, we'll, we'll send out a link. Uh, and for those of you who aren't flying home, we're going to be meeting at the Walker. Um, I would put you on the number two bus. Uh, 
but I don't know if you'd make it. So, um, <laughs> so I recommend. Yeah, go with Joe. Okay, uh, we'll look out for you, Texas, along the way. Um, but uh, find, you know, either Uber, Lyft, uh, or find somebody who's got a car. Uh, get in their car, um, and we'll be going there. Uh, well, we'll we'll pack everything up at five thirty, and then we'll go from here to there, and we start at there at six. And it's going to be so cool. So, <laughs> will there be snacks? What? <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, let's again thank Emmy. Thank you, Emmy, so much. Thanks to all of you guys for, for doing such a great job. Thank you.